So, speaking on pivot to the future, discovering value and creating growth in a disrupted world, can I welcome to the stage with a round of applause, Omar Abosh. Thank you, Dan. Good afternoon, COGEX. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> okay. I love being in the just before lunch slot, but I'll try and keep it pacey to keep everyone alert. So um, the story I'd like to tell you about today is ask you to cast your minds back just five years to 2014. Uh, and it's a story of two companies, one in technology and one in retail. The technology company was worth $300 billion in that time, and the retail company was worth $220 billion. So by all measures, these were considered successful, large, powerful companies, big established franchises, and they had been dominant for a long period of time. However, the retail company was living in the new world of Amazon, an era that people felt threatened by the, the development of online and e-commerce and what it would mean for companies that had huge physical square feet of, of, across the whole, uh, not only the United States, but beyond. And the technology company, despite all its prowess and excellence uh, in pioneering what had happened in the uh, solutions development and software industry, had missed search, had missed social media, and was not really that effective in the cloud space either. So they were viewed as laggards, they were viewed as dinosaurs. And then if you fast forward five years to today and say, what's happened to these companies? The technology company's value has gone up to $900 billion, and the retail company's added about 50% to its market capitalization to $300 billion. So I'm curious to know, like, what, what was it that happened with those two businesses? And it I'm, I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. It's uh, companies that have really affected the way people work and live today, uh, and they've thought very deeply about their impact, not just on their employees and their customer base, but on society and the wider planet as well. And that's come directly from their two top leaders. And I'm guessing that you know who I'm talking about, which is Microsoft and Walmart. Uh, back in 2014, Microsoft was not the go-to place for the best developers in Silicon Valley. It was not considered really the cool place. And Walmart, while successful, was a kind of pilot high, cheapest chips place, but again, not viewed in any way as being on the front end of innovation. And so, what have they done? Well, you know, two new leaders, 2014 with Satya Nadella and Doug McMillan, have come in with a whole series of thoughts around how do you bring innovation into these companies? So Microsoft acquired a company called Mojang. Many of you will know them as the, uh, the manufacturer, the builder of Minecraft. Uh, they bought LinkedIn. Everyone knows LinkedIn with its platform productivity, connecting people to one another. Uh, and GitHub which was the go-to repository for developers in Silicon Valley and beyond in terms of sharing their technology assets that they're building. And on the flip side, Walmart you know, doubled down in a very big way on e-commerce with their Jet.com acquisition and more recently with Flipkart in India. Can you hear that? <laughs> Someone's raining on the parade. Um, what they did is what we call a wise pivot. Uh, and what do I mean? So that's like studying the markets you're in and understanding that every market has a kind of an S-curve and recognizing that every business has an old and a now and a new. If you're at the top of the S-curve, it's your mature legacy business. The now is the exploding growth part of your core business. And then the new is at the bottom of a future S-curve, embryonic ideas for the future. And what Satya and Doug did is they thought hard about how do they move management attention, people, and money from the core business of today, gradually into the tomorrow business, the new business of, of tomorrow. And that's what they pulled off, these wise pivots. So in the case of Satya and Microsoft, in contrary to a lot of received wisdom of business that says, look, you've got to exit the legacy, you've got to ditch the old, you've got to milk the cash cow, and then move into the new, they, he actually took a different view, and he said, I've got this amazing franchise of Office and Windows. And unlike my predecessors, I'm going to allow those to be available on iOS, my arch enemy at Apple, and on Android, my other arch enemy at Google. You know, we buy Minecraft and we run it on Xbox, yes, but also it's available on PlayStation. You can get Windows on Facebook apps. And so what they found is they gave a new 
uh, life of, in the legacy business, a new fuel for growth in that old core business that they could then repurpose that in those investment dollars to bring them into the new areas that they want to be in. And so Microsoft obviously didn't make those moves lightly. Along the way were some very hard calls about the scope of the business. They took a $7 billion write down on the Nokia assets that they'd, that they'd spent money on for the Nokia handsets. But they took that money and the investment that they created, the investment capacity, and they put it into explosive growth in the cloud now business of Azure, in the productivity platform business of Teams and beyond. And, and they're creating, again, difficult calls along the way. I don't know how many of you will remember when Windows 10 came out, uh, they took a decision not to charge for it. Uh, 0365 today is the email platform that any enterprise that had Windows and Outlook before will be using as it migrates into the cloud. And so they've created a stickiness in their now business that's been very effective for the company. And they haven't taken their eye off innovation. So investing heavily in AI with Cortana, investing in immersive reality with things like the HoloLens, uh, and th investing heavily in future computing architectures like quantum computing. So thinking carefully about spreading their business between the old, the now, and the new, and managing that pivot gradually over time is what has helped Microsoft turbocharge itself from a $300 billion to a $900 billion enterprise. And I don't want to say super cool in Silicon Valley again, but in a very different spot from what it was five years ago. It's a, it is a go-to company for many, many people. Walmart, again, invested in heavy, old, physical infrastructure, retail, this thing that was being Amazoned and killed by e-commerce. But then they thought about, well, how do I put innovation into the physical space? So a deal with Alphabet's Waymo, the autonomous vehicle company, to bring shoppers to the stores. A deal with Japan's Rakuten, with the, the Kobo e-readers, to help people online and do the click and collect. So order online and then go and get your groceries while they're still fresh quickly at the store and save on shipping fees. Um, working with Uber, Lyft, and Postmates to deliver groceries. That's all still the core business of groceries in a store, but leveraging all of the modern digital innovation to find a new lease of life in that legacy business today and drive growth and drive investment capacity as fuel for the future. Um, Jet.com I mentioned earlier. Walmart had been in and out of Silicon Valley several times, actually. And it's a classic case of many corporations that make an investment in corporate VC or a corporate incubator in Silicon Valley, and then you get a bad quarter or two or a turn down, and the, the CFO shuts it off. Walmart eventually made a big bet on Jet.com. And the, what I like about what they did is not simply the, if you like, the boldness of the commitment, but actually they took the leadership, the entrepreneurial leadership, Mark Law and their team, and they recognized that the old rules of how you manage people inside corporations can't be applied equally across every type of person. These entrepreneurs needed a different compensation approaches, they needed different incentive structures, and they put them in charge not only of the old Jet.com assets, but the full e-commerce operations of Walmart, and thereby taking up, moving Walmart massively up the, the, the league tables in e-commerce in the US, and they're now in the, not, the top two or three. And with their Voodoo acquisition, uh, and which is essentially uh, streaming video, again, they're looking at real moves to compete with Amazon Prime in its core territory. And you'll say, um, you know, how has that helped Walmart today? And, and what, what I'm curious about is not only have they thought about applying digital in their core business, but they're still looking very firmly at personal shopping and computer vision through their Store 8 uh, incubator facilities in California and Austin, Texas. And their share price of Walmart in the last 12 months is up 14% um, relative to Amazon 6%. So again, it's a great story of a legacy company taking advantage of bond innovation and changing itself. Where did it begin? Well, as I mentioned, it actually began with two leaders who came in with a very different approach. And I'm sure that they would both say rightly that nothing is done by them alone, it's the team. But they began a lot of their thinking around people and culture. So in other words, how do you inspire the people to aim for something bigger than, in Microsoft's case, we're just a product company? And so, he actually said, look, our job here is to help people and organizations achieve more. It's a super aspirational, a super bold goal, but also it's very loose and wide open. You can make it what you want it to be. And that was very important for his people because actually the emphasis in the heart of that aspiration is on people. We're not, Microsoft is not about product. 
It's about helping people. And that's something that a lot of the people in the organization will lift themselves towards and want to uh, move towards. In the case of Walmart, the, the conversation here, again, is if I want to push the brand of Walmart, I'm going to push it through the actions of our people. What are we actually doing to help communities and people out there in the world today? And Walmart knows something about people. I think they employ around 2 million people, 500,000 of whom they put through advanced Walmart academies and training and service training to elevate their skills and their careers. And they make societal commitments as part of their thinking around management of people, or what we call the people pivot. So they'll say, um, OK, we're going to have a veteran's welcome home commitment in the US. And Walmart are today 80% of the way along hiring, I think, 206,000 people out of the 300,000 veterans that they've committed to hiring coming back from, from uh, active duty and active service around the world to work in Walmart stores and helping progress their careers to the next level as well. So this idea of purpose and people at the heart of what drives these journeys is a critical uh, message that I'd like to leave with you today. Have they done a transformation? So the classic business logic says, I'm at point A, I see these disruptive forces, I'm going to do a one-time transformation of the business and go to point B. And actually, our view is no. This is not about transformation. Transformation no longer cuts it, if it ever did. In fact, a lot of the rules that I talked about, like fast following or milking the cash cow, those rules don't work. Actually, it's about continual reinvention and recognizing that the business has to develop the DNA and the reflexes to continually reinvent different parts of it over time in a way that keeps it fresh and relevant to its end customers and its end consumers uh, over, over, a, over a period of time. So we talk about making a wise pivot. And a wise pivot uh, consists of three components. One around innovation. I've touched a little bit on innovation. How do I put innovation in the core of my business? Two, the CFO and the finance community have a very important role around capital allocation. How do I move money from the core business to the new business over time? If I go too quick, then I'm going to be ahead of the market and I'm going to overstretch myself. If I go too slow, which is by far the more common problem, I become obsolete and gradually irrelevant over time. And then the third component of the wise pivot is the people pivot. That's thinking about things like leadership. What mixture of entrepreneurs and operators must I have in my business across the old, the now, and the new over time? What kind of a culture do I need to develop? And most importantly, how am I going to bring my people with me? The old logic of you know, CEOs on the front page of Fortune or Forbes magazine by you know, I cut costs, which was code for I fired 10,000 people, that, that logic doesn't work anymore because if you dump a load of people and look to go and hire a load of new people, they don't exist. Those new people are not even there because the skills are scarce. And by the way, if they really are the special important skills like service design, machine learning, data, data science, whatever, they're being competed for by companies like Google and Uber and others where most corporations can't even compete at the price point. So thinking through the people pivot is a critical part of the journey over here. So innovation. Schneider Electric, this company is older than 100, more than 100 years old, started in pig iron. Today, it's industrial automation, industrial controls, energy management systems. They started making hardware. Then they move into saying, well, actually, we're going to put software in the hardware with the EcoStructure software suite, the Aviva suite. And then they connect the software to the internet. And the thing starts spewing off huge amounts of data. I think they sensorize something like half of the commercial property on planet Earth. What do you do with all of that data? Well, you build data, digital services on top of it with a digital services factory that bring products to market in eight months instead of three years. So a legacy industrial company adopting modern innovation techniques to bring new approaches to their customers to solve problems today. T-Mobile. This is a wireless carrier in the US. So you'd say, all right, so what's so interesting about wireless carrier? Well, if you go back a few years with T-Mobile, this company had the most useless network in the US out of all the operators. They had churn of customers leaving their business until they hired a guy called John Ledger. John Ledger is not a conventional CEO, for those of you who have followed him. Uh, you know, he runs his Sunday afternoon slow cooking class on Twitter. He's often communicating with his customers while jogging uh, down the road, you know, not out of breath. I mean, he's doing a, he's doing a great job on that. 
Uh, and, but he had this concept of being an uncarrier. They don't want to be a typical carrier like all the typical telecommunications companies. They want to give you what you want. So you want Netflix in your bundle? No problem. You want a different approach to roaming charges? Okay. You don't want to talk to an IVR system and wait on a call center to someone who's incomprehensible for ages. What do they do? They said, we're going to have all our call centers onshore in the United States. And not only that, when you call, you're going to go to the same pod of 20 people that always get your call so they know your story and they know your case. The net result is huge consumer following, massive consumer following, big churn in his direction away from the established carriers, generating the revenues he needed to invest in the network, and now he's building a strong network. And anyway, we'll see where the Department of Justice gets to, but they're in the middle of a merger with Sprint in the US today where they're on top. Uh, huge evolution thanks to the innovative approach that they took with engaging their customers. Financial pivot. So Jio in India, I don't know how many of you know about them. This company didn't exist in 2010. So in India, huge amount, number of people trying to join the middle classes in India. Mobile telecommunications are unaffordable for most people. Handsets were unaffordable. To give you a sense, data transmission costs were something like $60 per gigabit in India in that time. It was impossible for any normal person to afford. Uh, Mukesh Ambani from Reliance Industries, a multi-billionaire, comes in and says, we're going to make a bet, $30 billion bet, to build a network, a 4G LTE, long-term evolution network, that they have built out now. Today, it's a 270 million subscribers in the, in the country, and they've driven the cost of data transmission down to $1 per gigabit. So think about the implications of that for what that's done to the incumbents uh, in the telecommunications sector with that financial pivot that they've made. We talked about retail earlier, this horrible industry. No one wants to be in retail. Well, just at the time that everyone was thinking retail was horrid, Apple was investing heavily in retail space. Why? Because they thought hard about delivering a beautiful consumer experience. Today, in Apple's 500 locations globally, in the US, it's the most profitable at $5,000 per square foot retail estate in the whole of the United States because they've invested in the physical space but with the mindset of creating incredible, beautiful consumer experiences. I talked about the people pivot, and this one really is tricky. Like, how do you bring people with you? And, and oftentimes, clients will talk to me and say, you know, how do we adopt new technology? And, and uh, our conversation with them is, no, how do we get your existing people to adopt new technology? Like, how does that work? And I'm looking forward to discussing with my panel in a few minutes where we'll, we'll dig a bit deeper into that. But an example I'd like to call out is AT&T. So AT&T is a telecommunications company. They have network engineers. In the modern era, networking equipment is becoming more and more software defined. So there's more software in the equipment. Software, as you all know, has shorter and shorter lifespans. And so if you have engineers who've been there for 20 years as network engineers or, or longer, how do you keep them fresh? So they teamed with Udacity and Coursera and various other online courses to deliver an incredible array of digital training to their network engineers. And actually what they're signaling is a new compact between employer and employee. You know, the old compact may have been, if you become irrelevant, you're going to leave. The new compact is, as an employer, my job is to make it massively possible for you to learn everything you can to stay relevant. But you have to make that effort and do that training and pass those qualifications. And so they recertify the engineers every four years, and they stay uh, with the company over the long run. And that's a kind of a shift that I think we'll see more and more of across uh, companies around the world. JP Morgan uh, in, in banking in the US, a major commitment around new skills at work. They recognize that as a big a bulge bracket bank across the US, it's not enough to only operate, if you like, with a traditional, narrowly defined shareholder motive, that every company has a license to operate in society. And in order to retain its license to operate, it has to think about the communities that it serves. And so JP Morgan latched onto community colleges in the US, which is by far the most common form of vocational and, and uh, training aimed at disadvantaged communities, women, people of color, veterans, disabled folks. And they invested $350 million in the New Skills at Work program. But of course, the, there is a business logic in it for them beyond the, um, the philanthropic gesture. They're working with MIT to figure out who of their own population in the business would benefit from the upskilling and the reskilling that they're doing through these community programs that they can use to reskill their own people in the company. So it's easy, right? 
You just have to put innovation in the company. You've got to move money, uh, and you've got to work on your people. Well, unfortunately, it turns out it's not that easy. Uh, as we can see from the shorter lifespans of corporations in, in the FTSE or the Fortune 500 or whichever uh, measure you look at. Because, of course, every CEO you talk to knows that innovation is important. Uh, and they all are investing in innovation. In fact, as this chart just showed, they're investing to the tune of $3.2 trillion per annum in terms of big companies across the world. And what am I talking about? Uh, corporate venture capital, technology M&A, and R&D. Across big enterprises, $3.2 trillion per annum. It's a huge investment. And we've researched it across thousands of companies. But when you go and look at it and say, how are your returns on investment going? It turns out that most people, it's declining. So they're spending more on innovation, but only 14% of companies are delivering more returns. And you've got to ask yourself, well, why is that? And people are grappling with issues of, do I centralize innovation or do I distribute it? Should it be organic, let a thousand flowers bloom, or should it be a structured, top-down driven process? Should it be for continual improvement, incremental change, or should it be self-disruptive and you know, big step change? Those are the sorts of questions companies are grappling with, and so we wanted to study that closely, and as I mentioned, we analyzed thousands of companies, uh, and we learned a few interesting things. So we looked at innovation habits of, since the 1960s. We found 49 innovation habits that companies talk about using, and actually we boil it down to seven winning strategies that seem to make the difference for the 14% who are performing more versus the rest. And I'm going to drill into a couple of these uh, now. So the first one is about hyper-relevance. So this is about not just people buy your brand because you advocate it through traditional marketing. People buy your product and service because they love the experience you bring. And so when Disney launched a magic band in their parks, this means that when you bring your kids to the restaurant, you can arrive there, and instead of joining a one-hour-long queue with screaming children, the servers will bring the food that you pre-ordered via the app or the kiosk or your hotel room because the magic band will let you do that. That's about thinking about a different level of delivering an experience. Now, Disney stay on the front foot. So today, they've got studio labs where we're collaborating with them, where they're looking at the full range of modern technology to completely reimagine the production and the consumer entertainment experience of the future. So thinking about how does AI, blockchain, Internet of Things, and of course, augmented reality change the way in which we produce content and the way in which we consume it in the future. And that forward-leaning uh, position on innovation is critical. And one of the winning habits that we found is that companies that co-develop new products and services with their customers tend to get better outcomes. Second one is about network-powered or network-centered. This is, there's a few lessons in here. And I'm picking a platform example, even though most companies cannot ever become platforms. But there's some very good lessons that platform companies give us. I'm sure everyone here knows about Airbnb. There's a couple of interesting things. Firstly, Airbnb's revenues are only $3.8 billion. Its market cap is 10 times their revenues at nearly $40 billion. The revenues that flow through the platform, though, are about $30 billion. So there's a couple of lessons. Lesson one is in the modern era of highly connected technology, you have to be moving away from the traditional big company logic of master servant, where, I, where it's a, a zero-sum game, I'm going to keep all the revenues to myself. You have to think about sharing and how you share across an ecosystem of partners. The second logic is this recognition that no one company is good enough to do it all. And so you have to think about, actually, how do I build an ecosystem of partnerships with big and small partners to do more? And that means big companies have to learn how to work with small companies. So, you know, 60 days to sign a non-disclosure agreement with a startup probably doesn't cut it. Technology propelled. I, I grew up in an era where people talked about technology as an enabler. So, in other words, technology will enable companies to be successful. I, I don't believe that at all anymore. Uh, and when we researched the book that's a little bit behind the story I'm telling you today, what we discovered is that the winning companies are awesome at technology. If you're a bank, you better be good at consumer and fintech. If you're an insurer, you better know about telematics and telemetry. So every industry has to be amazing at thinking about the application of technology in its zone. So Bosch, industrial equipment in Germany, um, in the IoT space, six million connected devices, 
tons of data coming up. How do you manage all of that data? They build their own middleware, the Bosch IoT suite, 250 pilots and, and contracts around the world with the world's companies, helping them make use of connected equipment. So parking space detection, insurance rebate claims pursuit, or connecting your smartphone to your, your home lighting, your home smoke alarm, your home security systems. And then inclusiveness was one of the ones I spoke about. And I'm going to give a couple of examples from, from my company, Accenture. So for example, we, we team with Stanford University and law enforcement agencies in the US to look at how do you use machine learning on the tons of data that you can get from the tens of thousands of escort services sites out there to discover which ones are likely being used for human trafficking and direct local law enforcement towards those sites as opposed to the myriad of others. Drishti was an initiative that we ran out of our Innovation for Society uh, program that we have across the company out of India, where we would take a Google Glass type device, give it to a visually impaired person, combine it with natural language processing to let them to hear the environment that, that they cannot see. And, and we believe that actually one of the things that we've learned from, from the work studying the companies that are succeeding in this era of tech fuel disruption is not only do they master the wise pivot in the sense of innovation, finance, and people, but actually there is a correlation between companies that perform well financially and think about societal progress as part of their role in the communities and stakeholders that they serve. When we spoke to a bunch of executives, we found that 85% believe that modern tech forces corporations to rethink responsibility. 20% of them are spending up to 1% of their net profits on social initiatives. Between uh, 1 and 2% is 47% of the people of, 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 their, of their profit streams that they're investing. And so actually, the thing that I feel very heartened about is there really is a correlation between companies that perform well financially and deliver on societal progress. It's not an either or choice. And in fact, it's becoming ever more connected. I'd like to leave you with one final example. So this is Larry Merlo, the CEO of CVS. I don't know how many of you know CVS. Was a pharmacy chain in the US. Larry is no longer a pharmacist, but he has a lot of them. And when he got asked to become the CEO of the company, he asked some of his people, he got a group of people together and said, like, what do we stand for? You know, what are we about? And essentially the conversation was, is we help get people towards better health. And again, that became a purpose-driven rally cry for his organization. So last September, they limited massively the access to opioid painkillers in the US, in their stores. They've cut tobacco from their stores. They've stopped the airbrushing of models in their stores. They have put up a bunch of health hubs to make themselves now one of the biggest walk-in clinics across the country. So they're pivoting from being a pure pharmacy slash retailer into a healthcare destination where they want to be. And the bet that he's made with the acquisition of Aetna Health Insurance is a huge bet, and we'll see. But today, this is a $177 billion net revenue company, number seven in the Fortune 500. So it turns out to make these pivots uh, in this era of digital disruption and technology fuel change uh, takes a couple of things. You've heard me say it takes innovation. That's for sure. But it also takes courage. It takes CEO level courage. Because all of the examples I've just given here, some very hard choices had to be made along the road, often about the scope of the company, often about the scale of the investment dollars that were being made. But I'm utterly convinced that with innovation and courage, we can achieve almost anything. And with the amazing minds in this room here at COGEX, I'm sure that you can take your innovation and your courage to propel your organizations forward. So thank you ever so much for that. So I'd like to move into the next segment of this conversation and, and welcome. I've got three awesome panelists here to discuss with you what they're doing inside their businesses. I have Ramin Kress, the Chief Digital Officer at Henkel. Uh, Karen Ann Terrell, the Chief Digital and Technology Officer at GlaxoSmithKline, GSK. And Laura, uh, Lauren uh, Sager-Weinstein from TFL, the Chief Digital Officer there. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with me our guests as they join.
So, Karen, and I'm going to pick on you first. Awesome. Um, just from, uh, from what you heard, what resonated with you with what you're doing at GSK uh, in the terms of the changes that you're driving? Because you have an amazing experience and background. Maybe tell the audience a little bit about your own story, the, the, the companies you've been through, and what you've seen uh, along the way. I am a technologist, started out as an electrical engineer in the automotive business with GM and Mercedes when they bought Chrysler, and uh, moved to Pharma in Baxter, uh, and I was the CIO most recently before coming to GSK of Walmart. Uh, and I have been the Chief Digital Technology Officer for almost two years now at GSK. So I have seen uh, companies make pivots, whether it is under activist pressure uh, or whether it's under consumer pressure. Uh, and uh, so it, it, has been, it has been fascinating. What really resonated for me I think is, I don't like the old, uh, the now and the new. I think of it as uh, a digital as usual um, application, digital for reinvention, uh, as well as digital to disrupt. And I think of digital including data and analytics. That, that, I use a different language and I put percentages on it because I think it's important to measure, but um, I, I, that, that really, making sure that you have the landscape uh, covered as you think about uh, how you make that pivot to the future really, uh, really resonated. Yeah, that, that makes tons of sense to me, Karen. And I, I mean, by the way, inside Accenture, we never ever talked about the old. It was always the core business and the new business. But, you know, artistic license for a book, and, you know, we had to, we had to come up with some things. But, Lauren, how, how about you? What, what are your thoughts? maybe reflect a little bit about our journey at Transport for London. And before we get to the technology side, I'm going to talk about the, sort of the pivot that we did. I mean, the, the TFL is, is an, you know, an old service provider of, uh, of transport, um, but we did have a couple of key changes that I think has influenced how we think about delivering services for our customers and in terms of going forward in terms of what we do with the technology. And I think the two things are is that when we came together and brought all of our, our transport, public transport services and the key road network together in one place, that was a sort of a, a change into the delivery model. Um, but even so, it took us a little bit of time to sort of pivot as an organization. We were still thinking of ourselves as running trains, uh, running buses. And I think the pivot for us was when we began to really become, uh, using our language and our culture, uh, customer focus. And, and you'll see when you sort of look around um, on our posters, we talk about every journey matters. And I think it was really that, that language about that sort of customer focus allowed us to sort of, uh, sort of echo in and change our, sort of our, our approach in terms of our really thinking about the services that we are delivering. And then when, that, when we'll talk later about how we um, have used, in, in my case, in using data to transform what we do, it really harkens back to the sort of the pivot on the customer in terms of thinking about how do we deliver there. Well, um, well, for sure, we'll come back to that. I know that there's probably a large number of happy commuters out there, um, you know, from, from London. So we're bursting with questions for you, Lauren. So we will. And Ramin, why don't you uh, tell us how how's Henkel thinking about the pivot that you're you're in the middle of driving together? Um, yeah, I, th I think what resonates a lot is we're talking about uh, constant innovation as opposed to transformation. So I totally subscribe to the point that transformation sort of has this the notion of having an end state in mind, and I think we all know that that isn't the case. So it's a constant innovation path that you're on. Um, I slightly reject the old, uh, particularly working for an organization that is 142 years old. Yeah, please describe a bit what Henkel does so that I, everyone knows. Uh, so Henkel is a specialist uh, chemical organization under whose umbrella there are three core businesses. One of them is in beauty, one of them is in laundry and home care, and the other one is the TC Technologies. So very much, in my mind, a problem-solving entrepreneurial organization uh, that, as I said, 142 years old. So I reject the all because I actually think uh, that that is negative connotation. I think an organization like ours has so much experience and value to offer by having been around for 142 years. And I think our biggest task is to re-energize the entrepreneurial spirit in our organization, 
in order to sustain for the next 142 years. So that is the, the activity of what we're driving. Okay. So, I mean, there's a couple of common themes here. There's renewal of the core business, the continual innovation. Uh, sounds uh, extremely pertinent. So, so um, m maybe, Lauren, why don't you talk a little bit about how you think about putting innovation in the business so that uh, it's not just your job or a couple of other leaders' roles in the company? I mean, I think this comes back to, if you really want to make innovation stick, being very focused on what you're trying to achieve. And I think it goes, out, goes to that sort of core message. Um, and it, when we've tried things, so I think one of our sort of key innovations was on our ticketing system where we um, sort of thought about a successful smart car system called Oyster, but what could we do? What could we do with it um, to sort of to innovate and sort of improve it? And that sort of innovation sat in sort of a core central sort of uh, sort of element of uh, in terms of organizationally in terms of what we did at CFL. It was we had a, a clear case of just sort of doing something different, and and we drove the innovation from there. And I think we, we spoke earlier when we were uh, catching up about different models for doing it. And I think for our case within TFL. We require that sort of that 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 focus and sort of need to innovate um, to solve a business problem, um, and that was really sort of giving us a, sort of the strength to innovate. And that's where we sort of brought in the sort of contactless payment technology, um, a new approach, and that allowed us um, to sort of improve our customer experience and sort of reduce our operating costs, and has been very sort of successful for us. Um, and and that really I think goes to sort of the heart of our of our approach. We do sort of also want to encourage that across the business, but I think it's really having that key focus on what you're trying to achieve and help them. So, so I'm going to ask Karen Ann the same question, but, but just I'll come back to you after, Lauren. Just to tell us about how you measure and how you assess customer centricity, like, and what feedback you get from customers and uh, the, the, from, from all those programs and initiatives that you just, you just mentioned. But I mean, Karen Ann, innovation at GSK, how does it work? So I think you have to focus on unlocking value uh, on the value propositions that the customer or the patient gives you permission for. Um, for us, um, innovation capital I always has to do with innovations in uh, the medicines uh, and the products that we make. There is a really clear focus on the science that has to go towards innovating in medicines. And I think that this is an important differential for GSK. GSK is a 300-year-old business. It's made up of three businesses. The now number one OTC business in the world, over-the-counter uh, drugs that are in retail, uh, that products that are in retail, vaccines, number one vaccines company in the world, and um, our pharma business. And when you look across all of those, um, innovation, capital I, has really got to go around unlocking value and driving the best medicines that are possible. And you have to be really clear that everybody doesn't call it little I and runs off uh, because you can, you can have a probably 100,000 great ideas, but the ones that will make the most difference to your patients and your customers are the ones that you've got to put all the wood behind the back. So, so I totally get that the core, core, core business is the science, the creation of the new molecules. And so that's the big eye focus. But how do you get the folks in the middle of that who are smart, deep, scientific PhDs, how do you get them to innovate? Oh uh, my uh, gosh, so uh, yeah. science, technology, math, and engineers, these are people who are right in the vortex of change and often can be the most change resistant. Uh, as you uh, as you are trying to really change paradigm, they uh, they see the technology that they're using as a tool, and they don't understand that the technology could actually become uh, the support around the drug or around the product. Um, I, I think there's two things that they always respond to. Uh, number one is experimentation that actually points the path in the right way, and the second is that they are teamed with and working with the very best and the smartest and the brightest that are in the world. This is something that as technologists, we respond uh, to those things. And experimentation and the ecosystem that you talked about, the digital ecosystem, has been the greatest opportunity for us to move at speed uh, with disruptive thinking and change. Oh, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, Ramin, so you think of innovation differently at Hankel. Um, well, uh, I think to the point that you just made, uh, we, I think there are different dimensions of innovation. So we have uh, last year, February, launched Hankel X, 
which is our uh, open innovation platform. And very, very quickly to explain, it's built on three core pillars, which is ecosystem, experimentation, and experience. Um, what we believe in and what is shown is similar to what you said on your outset, we very strongly believe that nobody can do it on their own. And as an organization like ours, we need to build ecosystem partnerships to work with many in order to really accelerate to where we need to be to then create further innovation on top. And I think overall, uh, there is some legacy that needs to be caught up. Uh, too many large uh, organizations have been caught in the headlights. Um, for us to step up the game, we now all need to get together and really build baseline infrastructures, common way of thinking to expand on top. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is, uh, you know, ultimately providing our entire network, which is made up of Henkel X mentors coming out of venture capital, Fortune 100 C-suites, and entrepreneurs, pairing them up with uh, industry partners together with Institute of Entrepreneurship, which is a program that we run with some of the most amazing faculties, and out of that build effectively unfair advantages for the ecosystem. And, and, and how do you get the, the core business units, like the, the folks sitting in adhesives, to yeah. care? Like, how do you get them to pay attention and engage with this? Uh, first of all, uh, some of the mentors that we have are of such magnitude that uh, they really are the movers and shakers of the digital ecosystem as we know it today. And without going into details on the name, uh, there really are individuals that don't only have an opinion, they have so much experience and are able to open doors that the value of them as individuals to the entire ecosystem is of such that people want to talk to them, number one. Number two, as we are moving forward, uh, those partnerships lend themselves to bringing innovation, startups, uh, other entrepreneurs which become investment opportunities for us as Henkel, but also for the entire industry in which we're driving collaboration. Now, at the beginning, of course, there's a lot of, you know, here's another activity. But once you have two or three that actually become tangible and you see what it does to your business, it starts on its own. And so Henkel X, its mentorship program, what we have created is beyond a platform, it becomes an ecosystem that we launch in various markets, various countries, and very diverse industries, and that then feeds itself and becomes uh, an organic growth system. You know what, in the truth telling, a lot of people are not gonna be converted. Yeah. There's, uh, when, you, when you look across an organization that may have 110,000 people, uh, there are a lot, even, even at the senior levels, uh, that it's very difficult as they hold on to the business models that they currently have. You had to have experienced that at Accenture. Successful business that you had as you made the pivot. We're seeing the same thing at GSK, uh, any, of, uh, any of those stories. And I think the question becomes, does everybody have to go um, on the journey in order to be successful, or can you actually generate momentum? Uh, and I think that you know, at GSK, we do that culture by culture. We look at the way change has always been made at GSK, and we actually just supercharge it and hyper-accelerate it within our, uh, our own culture. But I just think it's realistic that not everyone can or wants to go on that journey. I'd love to hear how, how it's I'd like to I'd like to build on that. I, I agree, but uh, I also think not everybody has to. I think there is this element of, you know, everybody has to be an entrepreneur, everybody has to be a game changer. That is now. Uh, sooner or later, people need to adopt the new technology for what it's worth for carrying on with the business and driving growth and the best. But not everybody has to be the game changer themselves. I agree. So I think that sort of bringing it back to us then, if we're thinking about what's the role of leading in an organization and being sort of an innovate, innovators and encouraging that innovation, I think that knowledge that you know, where do you find sort of the, the areas where there is a strong appetite um, to, sort of to change and how do you sort of focus that, that innovation and foster that in, in a particular area where you're going to land it with an outcome. Um, maybe that's where we need to sort of, uh, sort of focus some of the efforts. Because that's certainly been my experience where um, there are going to be areas where you're pushing against a wall at first. 
maybe they'll leave for it later, but there's some areas where there's just such an appetite to do things differently and to use, and particularly the way technology and data is changing and unlocking things. Um, people are hungry for it and you know, beating the door down. So I think if you, if you have an approach that focuses on them and you build your allies, that's certainly been what's been effective for us. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll tell you a little bit about the Accenture story, although I don't want to pretend for one second that either we're done or that it's at all easy, but, but there are a couple of advantages we have. So Accenture is 77% millennial, which means that that's way ahead of the general employed population, uh, which, which means that actually those folks want to learn skills, want to become uh, exposed to more optionality in their lives, whether for within Accenture or beyond. And so we, we created an incredible array of digital connected learning that is available to everyone 24-7. It's peer curated, it's external, it's internal. I mean, it's just a whole spectrum so that people can learn and develop their skills in every single domain of the business, including renewing the core business. So there's a, there's a huge focus on that and it's in the culture and we make heroes of the people who publish and the people whose assets get used the most, com you know, most often and so on. So that, that, that's one element. The second thing is we're obsessed with the, this, not only diversity, but specifically uh, inclusion. So, so we know that you can't be innovative without extre extraordinary diverse thinking. And that, that only comes from diverse sets of people. But having the mix of people alone isn't enough. They have to have be, feel ready to raise their voice. And that's through creating an inclusive environment. So we've, uh, under the leadership of our late chairman and CEO, our um, chief uh, leadership and HR officer, Ellen Shook, I mean, those people have made it a huge effort to make us rethink how do we create a more diverse, more inclusive environment that contributes a little bit to putting us on the front foot uh, of all of this change? Finally, as the scope of the company shifted, we had to recognize that the monolithic, singular culture that we all grew up with was not going to work. Uh, and um, I'll give you two examples. So at one extreme, we've got our folks in our Accenture Interactive designers, so people from agencies like Kamarama or Droga5 in the US. I mean, those folks are super cool. So for them, I'm in an excessively uncool category of individuals. Uh, and and th those, those are, you know, leading edge creatives. And at the other end of the spectrum, we've got folks coming out of military intelligence units driving Accenture security. And the, those are a different category of, of person as well. So we've embraced a culture of cultures as part of our, of who we want to be and who, who we think yeah, we, sh we share core values, but we accept and in fact encourage a, a range of different cultures in the business. So. And actually, I think the orthogonality of thought applied to business is a, is a really big secret. If you're, if you're working in a small company, what you want to do is get into a big company. Uh, the GSK way of thinking about that is we're actually three companies. I'm sure that's the Hinkle story, but we are a fast moving uh, over the counter consumer FMCG company. We're also a vaccines company, which is a, a little bit like a consumer good, but prescribed. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we're a cancer company. We're, uh, we're an HIV company. We're a, we're a lupus company. So when you look at the orthogonality of those businesses, it's, it's not that we look at our data end to end and we can tell if you have HIV and you take Excedrin and you took a Shingrix shot. It's not that type of uh, <laughs> horizontal, it is looking at uh, high science inspired products uh, and how you use um, genetics yeah. and the information associated so, with So Karen, and you're moving us to data and I'm gonna go there, but just before I do, I just wanna make a shout out to Ben and Johnny at the back. You know, we have no clock here and you're gonna get me into trouble with Charlie and Tabitha, so <laughs> if, you, if you could uh, g like tell us the, the, the clock. <laughs> Okay, five minutes. Okay, I'll use nine. No, nine. 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 Okay, <laughs> traditional technology. Okay, all right. Okay, okay. Thank, th thank you. Okay, so data. I mean, you talked about data there a little bit. The, the, I mean, data. I mean, traditional companies are not famous for using their own data well. Sometimes not even knowing what they have, and yet we've entered an era where the general public, citizens, consumers care about how data is treated. So. Uh, Lauren, will you talk a little bit about how you think about that with TFL? I mean, you probably know where each of us is every moment of the day, and uh, yeah, so, so. Well, so let me talk about this with TFL case because you know this has been interesting, and I've actually had the the privilege of being involved um, in thinking about data before there was a data industry. So, um, and I've been at TFL. Um, my job, 
I was doing, the job I do now didn't exist. I was uh, looking at um, first and sort of overall strategy work. Um, and then um, as I was doing that, began to sort of see how with the data that we're beginning to get from the system, so from where our buses were on the network um, to where our so revenue information coming out of our ticketing system um, with an Oyster card, that you could see this potential. Um, but of course, you know, there's, there's two parts of this. There's the first part, which is data is very messy, um, and these systems, when they were built, were never designed to actually have you extract and use this data, so there's a, a lot of pain, um, and I'm sure other sort of people involved in data could all have a, a sob session about <laughs> the balance dog on that. But on the other side, there was a real importance in, in setting out at the outset, what are our data principles? And so we had two. Um, the first one was about making sure we are were very clear and transparent about how we were using data from our customers, talking to our customers about how we collected it and what the use was for, and giving our customers a chance to um, to be known to us if they want to be, but not if they don't, and, and being very secure about how we store our data. And that was for all the personal data that has been our approach um, you know, from from the outset, and it's very important. Uh, it, it is, it's, it's important for us to have uh, the trust of our customers um, uh, and that's fundamental. The other side of this was thinking about how do we think about our systems data that isn't personal. And we have an approach to sort of making, uh, opening up that data and making it available. And that, again, there was a lot of debate about do we charge, do we want to know when the bus is coming, that's no. Um, very clear that was, that, that was not the right approach. And so, we, um, <laughs> and we can sort of see the, see the big picture for releasing um, data for customers to understand and, and, um, what was happening on the network. And that's been sort of hugely successful in terms of making our systems um, operate more effectively. You know when the bus is coming, um, you know whether to get a cup of coffee or not, or whether to walk. And it, it, nowadays it sounds pretty trite, but at the time we were thinking about this, there were, there were debates to be had. And I think those two sort of um, principles were really were important in terms of how we evolved with the data that we're doing. And I guess the, the third principle I have is that investment in data is, is again, as I mentioned, fiddly and, and time consuming. So you should be very clear about what you want and what business problem that you're I love that example of the you know pave to know when your bus is going to arrive. It reminds me of an airline company that will remain nameless that was considering at the same time charging you for going to the bathroom uh, on an airplane. Um, Karen Ann, how do you get across the silo issue? The, you know the, the the 20th century corporation was built in these silos. The leaders of those units are awesome at optimizing and running efficiently in those groups. And now you want to share data across these things to create something bigger and better. How do you think about tackling that? So I like the way you, uh, I, I like the way you talk about the data associated with customer expectations and the way that you think about the data that is actually just the operational uh, information. Because at that point, uh, you have to look horizontally and say, uh, how do I unlock value that actually has operational value to the company? And that, that is something that there isn't a single person in the company that says, no, no, no. I don't want to unlock any value here. Uh, and then, so I think in the data and analytics journey that we're on, um, two things have been absolutely crucial in that journey. Number one um, is setting out that you're going to have horizontal platforms. You're not going to pay for individual um, silo platform of the data. That you're going to have um, a, a fully modern data and analytics platform into which you're going to feed that data. And that's, that's a decision that a technologist makes. That's not a decision that a business unit makes. That's a, that's a technology decision across. And I think the second element is that you go after the data, not as putting it all in and then a miracle happens um, of big, huge value that comes up, but you go after it for us on what we call value strikes. If agile MVP-based development is the right way for digital products, then agile MVP-based experimentation is the way that you go after value in order to look at data across. And we've been in the process of doing that and it unlocked extraordinary value in the 40%. And I think that that's a critical way to actually drive the organization to be data driven and infused in an agile way of working, which are both extraordinarily important in order for us to be sustainable in the future. Thank, thanks, Karen. And so you're not a big fan of data warehouses, I think I understood there. I, I am, but I'm not a big, huge fan of dead lakes that you inject it and expect value will come. Uh, I think that you can build those things. Build it and they won't come? As you go. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm not the field of dreams. <laughs> okay, I'm okay. So, Ramin, I'm going to give you the last word. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm wrong, but when I think of Henkel, I think more of a B2B company. 
So, so now I know you've got beauty in the, like in, in the in the B2C space, but how do you think about data across those two, the spectrum of all the different things that you do? So I think, uh, first of all, we are B2B2C, so the C is very important for us, whilst it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to do all of my sales and execution and direct deliveries to the end customer. So definitely for the retailers in the room, Henkel is the best friend of <laughs> retail and omni-channel. Um, number two, I think of data uh, uh, not for the sake of data, but really to deliver value to the customer, to the people. So when Lauren and I, uh, I hope I'm not taking away from that, are announcing our new service, by which when you go to the bus station in London, Hangar comes, picks up your cleaning, and then we drop it off when you go home in the evening by tube. Um, uh, that's a thought, right? Um, <laughs> that is using data to collaborate between business partners, and that drives value, okay? Um, and that is really the data, uh, unlocking the data. So, you know, when we talk data silos, you know, a lot of organic growth companies uh, 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 like ours over the years have made acquisitions. Of course, by legacy, it is now that we're thinking about the data lakes and God knows what. But ultimately, the importance is you need to fix that. If you don't have the visibility and transparency of that, then everything you do, in my opinion, becomes at best a campaign and you can't grow on that. Number two, you see I'm being very bold because I have the last word. Number yeah, but two, you, have, you, have a, you have a time limited last word. Um, you know, so it's like, you know. Number two, yeah, I yeah, think extending yeah. on that, it is yeah. all business driven and really creating value. And that's, again, why the ecosystem is so important. Awesome. I mean, thank you so much, the three of you, for amazing wisdom and nuggets of insight there that we can all use. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Lauren, Karen, Anne, and Ramin. Okay, let's go.